Good morning, my friend. I am excited to be with you today. It is time for another Friday conversation, and this week is a special treat. A few weeks ago, we had Tommy Walker back on the show, um, and Tommy, at the end of that conversation, said, Hey, you know what? I have an idea. It, he, he said, I don't want to be presumptuous, but I would like to take over your show for one episode and interview you. I think people would want to hear some you answer some questions, things we might want to know about you and why you do the things that you do and all of that. And we just had this conversation about that potential episode, and we decided, hey, let's go for it. So today's Friday conversation is a reversal of the natural order of things. Tommy Walker is interviewing me. We did not rehearse this. I had no idea what he was going to ask, so it's just raw. There's a little emotion in it. And we had an almost hour-long conversation, a worship leader interviewing a brain surgeon, and we had a great time. Tommy um, is sort of my, for lack of a better word, he's my brother from another mother. Um, my, <laughs> he's one of these people I've never met in real life, but we are very close, and I love him um, to death. And, and the, of course, we support, Lisa and I support the work that Tommy Walker Ministries does around the world, and you should too. TommyWalkerMinistries.org is... Um, just a remarkable uh, worldwide ministry equipping worship leaders and worshipers across the world. Um, and you should check them out, TommyWalkerMinistries.org. Well, without further ado, I'm going to give you this interview that Tommy Walker did um, with me. It's uh, going to be our Friday conversation for Season 7, Episode 6 of the Dr. Lee Warren Podcast. Worship leader interviewing a brain surgeon, and we get to the point that you can't change your mind until you change your life. And the good news is, Lisa, as she is always telling us, is that we can start today. Hey, are you ready to change your life? If the answer is yes, there's only one rule. You have to change your mind first. And my friend, there's a place where the neuroscience of how your mind works smashes together with faith and everything starts to make sense. That place is called self-brain surgery. You can learn it and it will help you become healthier, feel better, and be happier. And the good news is you can start today. Thanks, Lisa. Hey, so glad to have you listening today. I'm Dr. Lee Warren, and I live in Nebraska in the United States of America with my incredible wife, Lisa, my father-in-law, Tata, and the super pups, Harvey and Lewis. I'm a neurosurgeon and an author, and I'm here to help you harness neuroscience, the power of your brain, faith, the power of your spirit, and good old common sense to help you lead a healthier, better, happier life. Listen, friend, you can't change your life until you change your mind, and I'm here to help you learn the art of self-brain surgery to get it done if you like the show. Please subscribe so you never miss an episode and tell your friends about it. If you tell two or three friends this podcast was helpful to you, imagine how much good we can all do around the world together. I'm Dr. Lee Warren, and I'm here to help you change your mind so you can change your life. Let's get after it. Friend, we're back. I'm excited to to have a different kind of thing with you today. We've got uh, my main man, Tommy Walker, with us today. How you doing, Tommy? Doing great. It's good to see you. And last time we talked, we talked about worship and, and you did a great job helping us understand how worship goes with gratitude before Thanksgiving. And, and you said, I think I ought to interview you sometime and have kind of a backwards interview. And I said, that sounds like fun. So guess what, folks? That's what we're doing today. Tommy Walker is going to interview me. So let's get after it. Tommy, would you like to pray for us before we get started? I would love to. All right. Lord, we just thank you. That you are, or two or more gather in your name, that you promise to be with us, and you're here, and we just pray you grace us with your presence and guide every word, and just thank you for friendship, and and I just pray that there'll be nuggets of truth that will be brought out that will be so life-giving and bring freedom to people this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay, I, I'm okay. relinquishing control of my podcast at Tommy Walker right now, okay. unscripted. Here we go. All right. I just want to let everybody know that I have not prepped Dr. Lee. He has no idea what I'm about to ask him. So this is all for real. <laughs> and I mean, I mean, I would imagine all of you would love to be able to do this. I mean, how often does somebody get to ask questions to such a brilliant man is Dr. Lee. So anyways, <laughs> here's my first one. Um, when did you first, when and how did you first discover it? Did you wake up one day when you're five years old? I want to be a brain surgeon. Tell us how that happened. Actually, I, I, my mother and dad say that the only thing I ever told them I wanted to be when I grew up was a doctor. Um, that I, and we didn't have any medical people in our family. So that, that had to have been the 
calling on my life from the Lord, but I never thought I was going to be a brain surgeon. I, I thought I was going to be, I, I come from a small town of 2000 people in Oklahoma, Tommy a town called broken bow. Um, and I thought I was going to be, you know, the small town doctor, go back home and, and be the family practice doctor and take care of my neighbors and get paid in chickens and that kind of stuff. And, uh, it wasn't until I got to medical school that I realized I didn't really have the personality type to do primary care. I'm, um, I have a short attention span and I, and I, I like to solve something and move on to something else. And I, and I just couldn't, I couldn't deal with chronic illness that never gets better and that sort of thing. So I realized pretty quickly when we started in the third year of medical school, you do a, a series of rotations and you get a little taste of everything. And, and I realized pretty quickly, I liked surgery. I, I like doing things with my hands and I like somebody coming in with a particular problem that you could fix and they get better or they don't get better, but there's an end point to it. And then you go on to something else. And that really worked well with me, but actually it was my, my son, Mitch, um, when we found out he was going to be born in February of, of uh, 94 that required a schedule change for me. So I could have a little bit of time off when he was born. And the only option I had was to either do an, a rotation in orthopedic surgery or in neurosurgery to free that time of my schedule up. And, um, I just asked a question, how much, how much do I have to be on call? And they, and they said that orthopedic r- rotation required every other night call and the neurosurgery rotation, you didn't have to take call at all if you didn't want to. I was like, I'll take that. And <laughs> within about three days, um, I knew that's what I was supposed to do with my life. Like it was just wow. exactly right for me. It was computers and lasers and microscopes and complex problems and intricate anatomy. And it just, it was like, wow, I never, I never knew about this, but there it is. Huh. Well, that's, it's kind of cool and interesting that, um, Mitch played a role in what you're still doing to this day. That's yep. pretty beautiful. Um, so is it true that from from the start of your life, you, you've done 40 years of education? <laughs> Wait, rephrase that question. I thought I heard you say once, I might have been imagining it. You know, starting from kindergarten or first grade until you were completely done with all education to become a brain surgeon. It was 40 years or how no. many years was it? <laughs> no, no. I said I started kindergarten at five and I finished my residency at 32. So, so that's, the, that's how long I was in school from five to 32. So that's a long time, but it's not 40 years. <laughs> that's a long, long time. Um, is there any type of doctor that requires more schooling than a neurosurgeon? No. Um, you can, you know, if you have all the surgical specialties get out there pretty close to one another. So general surgery is five years after med school and neurosurgery is seven or eight now and orthopedics is five and all of that. But if you have subspecialty interests, like you want to specialize in pediatrics or or some nuance of one of those fields, then you can do fellowship training, which adds another one or two or three years on. So there may be some people who train longer than the average neurosurgeon, but, but the basic to become board certified, it's the longest path. Wow. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, here's a question, a dumb question, but maybe it'll make me feel good about myself. Is there any simulator? Are there any skills that are, that musicians and record are, you know, similar musicians and surgeons. I think so. You know, I, 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 without hyperbole, I have probably a dozen times taken one of your videos and showed it to Lisa and said, how can he do that with his hands? Like he, he can do things with his left hand that I can't do with my left hand. Um, you can play a chord that covers you know, 19 frets or something. And, that's an exaggeration, but you can, you can do things with your hands that require great delicacy and skill. And I think the, the secret, the, the place where that comes together with neurosurgery, and I think any, any type of procedural career is, is repetition, right? So you do something a million times and it becomes something that you know how to do without thinking about. Um, but also, um, an eye for detail and an attention to detail. So you can play a chord without having all the muted notes sound out incorrectly. And I can, you know, take a little nerve hook and I can 
delicately move an artery off of a, of a off of a nerve without tearing either one because I've done it 10,000 times, right? And you've done it 10,000 times. So I think there's a lot of that sort of thing. Um, but also just a, a, a desire for making it right each time, making it better each time. That, that, that That's a goal that I think musicians and, and physicians have in common. It's interesting to me that it's not only that you know what you're doing. You're like, okay, I need to remove this or move this or whatever, but it takes actual physical steadiness and still and practice to actually do it well. Like, like, is it true that like, you, like they talk about a surgeon's steady hand, you know, that kind of thing? Well, yeah, I mean, there's, there's some element to it, but for the most part, I mean, you can train. Well, I think there's a, there's a floor, right? There's some people that, could never play a guitar in their whole life, no matter how hard they try. They just didn't have the aptitude. And there are some people that couldn't become competent surgeons because they don't have the aptitude or drive. But when you get to the point where you've passed the test and gotten into medical school and gotten into residency training and done all those things, there's a there's a pretty trainable group of folks that get that far. And then I think beyond that, um, how you are able to accomplish a particular procedure comes down to um, – training and reputation and, and all of that. But at, at some level, there are some surgeons who can do things that other people can't do. Um, mm. And so it, I think you select yourself for that as you, as you go through your training. Um, one of the things I loved about residency training is you have, you know, 15 or 20 board certified neurosurgeons training eight or 10 residents. And, and so you learn 15 or 20 different ways to scan a particular cat. We don't actually scan cats, but, but you know, <laughs> You learn a bunch of different approaches to a particular problem. So when you when you're trying to clip an aneurysm or, or remove a brain tumor or whatever, you you learn. Okay, if this doesn't work, I remember Doctor Maroon taught me that, and if that doesn't work, I remember Doctor Bagai taught me that, and I can apply that those sets of problem solving skills. And so steadiness of hand is important, but I think training and and learning how to apply different techniques when they're appropriate is probably more important than. Just do you have the genes to be super rock steady or not? It was very interesting to me when your pod podcast, you were talking about how you have to be super gentle and super strong at the same time. So you have situations where you have to, one part of it is real ginger and the other part takes like force and, and uh, muscle. And I, I, I mean, I just can't imagine that, but well, there's parts of surgery that are like hard and heavy. You know, I That's guess. Right. That's, That's right. That? I'm trying to find a picture I'm going to show you that illustrates that really well. I'll send it to you if I can't find it here in a second. But um, I did a, a spinal fusion surgery the other day, and yeah, I can't find it real easily here. But um, it it basically you've got a spinal cord, right? Exposed. And so somebody's, somebody's entire nerve sac is laid out and it's big around as your thumb and every, every ability they have to feel or move their legs and their, every part of them from the waist down is going through that little tube. Right. And I've got to get a, a metal cage. It's about the size of my pinky finger into the disc underneath that spinal cord in order to stabilize these two bones that are loose with one another and in order to fix that in order to get that cage in i've got to hit that thing with a hammer pretty hard i've got to i've got to pound it into those bones and so you can't slip a millimeter to the left or you're going to hit the spinal cord with that cage right and you can't slip a millimeter to the right because there's a nerve root that moves his foot over there so so you have to be able to apply this this great force this you know, tremendous about that hard with a literal hammer on the back end of that cage and you can't miss. Right. So there's, there's some of that sort of precision meets power that, that I still think is fascinating after all these years. Oh. Wow. That really makes me not want to have surgery. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> um, all right. So fascinating to me. I hope this is interesting to all of you out there. It is to me. I mean, it is just so fascinating. So here's a really big question. We talked about it a little bit, but um, how do you, 
how do you leave your work at work, especially when something doesn't go well or, you know, whatever, however you want to describe it. And you just come home and cause you can't just carry everything. I don't know. Just tell me how you do that. Yeah. That's uh, that's really the question. I think it, it, I, I have a great blessing in my career in that Lisa ran our practice for 12 years. And so we, we did it together. So she knew what I was experiencing and I would come out of the OR and I'd call her up and say, Hey, Mr. Jones that we saw yesterday, you know, he, he didn't make it or he, Mrs. Mrs. Smith is doing great after surgery. And, and so I had that, that partner who knew what I was going through and, and was experiencing it and understood it. And so even though now we don't work together on that level, um, I have a, I have a partner in my house who, um, knows what I'm what I'm going through, right? So that really helps. So I can say, man, I had a rough case today. And she knows what I mean by that. So I think part of it is having a, a good support system. But part of it too is you, you really um in fact I had a professor <laughs> I had a professor when I was a resident. I was the only Christian in my group. Like it was I was widely vilified and and beaten on psychologically for being a person of faith as a resident. Um, and I had a person in my first year who said, you will never make it. And I said, why do you think I won't make it? And he said, you're too soft. Like you, you care too much. Like you, it's just going to eat you up. You're going to, you'll never make it. You'll wash out. You'll become a family practice doctor, obstetrician or something. And and I was like, well, those people have to be compassionate too. <laughs> but, but I, what I learned was like, you have to decide that, that while you're taking care of this person, that, that you are a hundred percent in with them and invested in them, but you are not them. Right. So when I when I leave the, the parking lot, I don't stop thinking about them. But the the situation that they're in, the, the tumor, the injury, the the prognosis, the prognosis or whatever, it's it's that person and their family that have to live with that. I'm there to guide them and interact with them and operate with them or whatever. But when I go home, I've got to I've got to I've got to put that emotion on my life and my family and. And if I can't separate those two things, I think that's when you become an absentee father or you become an alcoholic or something else happens because you can't you can't be responsible for everything that everybody's going through all the time. You just mm-hmm. can't be. And so I think I, I think I learned at some early point that that while I'm with you and engaged in your care, I am 100 percent your guy. But when I'm not with you, I've got to give that emotional energy to my family and, and my, my wife and my life and my spiritual life and all those things so that I have the fuel to be that for you the next day again. You know, that's interesting to me because it correlates a little bit with something Rob and my wife and I have been talking about a lot where you, we have several situations and people on our prayer list, you know, and there is an interesting balance between really carrying people's burdens and praying for them and yet also being able to release to to because you can't carry everything like you just said and everybody all the time so it's kind of like a at the same time you're you're caring and you're praying and believing you're also releasing in faith and letting go and um, so there's really a correlates like that i think yeah, I think that's a that's another place where pastors and and therapists and and people that work in that in that space align with physicians. I, I think that, that I think those two things are are very similar. Yeah. Um. So, do you have any anything you'd like to say about how being a doctor and knowing so much about the human anatomy uh, builds your faith? In God versus taking it away. There's so many doctors that it seems to me, at least in California, that are not Christians. You have anything to say about that? Yeah, I mean, I you know, I I think all of us have a worldview, right? We all come into our professions with a, a background and a history and a training and all those things that a bias. Um, and I'm blessed to have been raised, you know, in a Christian home and, and with parents who studied the word of God and, and named Jesus as, as their savior. And, and, and so I didn't have 
a skepticism about spiritual things even when I got to medical school. So I, I had a belief, I believed. Um, and it really, for me, it was never um, science versus faith. It was how can I make science and faith work together? Because I saw the scientific method as a way, a great way to approach even spiritual matters. You know, the, the scientific method classically taught is, is you have a question, why does this thing do the thing that it does or what makes this thing work? And then you observe it and you ask questions of it and you devise tests to to look into it more completely and you and you come up with a hypothesis to try to explain it and then you test the hypothesis and revise it as necessary and you finally come up with a a, a law right something you know um and i thought that's a pretty good way to to approach life and then what i realized as i went through medical training tommy is um there's two sciences there's big s capital s science and there's little s lowercase science and lowercase science is scientific method and, and testing and refining and, and there's no reason for lowercase science to object to faith at all because ultimately if you go far enough back in little less science you come to a place where there's a, there's a point at time at the beginning where nothing can be tested further than that and you just have to decide what you believe about it you, you can't you can't test it or observe it any further back than that right and so I, it dawned on me hey th- these folks that are adamant naturalists that are that are real big s science so so capital s organized science scientists they are just as much religious people as i am they, they got just as much faith in their religion as i do but the problem is they stopped being scientists because they stop being willing to admit that they they can't know everything and they, and they have to be and you have to tell the truth about what you know and don't know. And so if there's a point in time in the past when I can't look any further back, right, the, the beginning, then that means I have to accept some things on faith. And so at that point, I'm like, well, if I have valid reasons to believe the things that I believe about the Lord and about spiritual matters, then that's no less scientific than it was for me to just accept that there's a a beginning, a big bang or whatever. And so I never saw it as a conflict. So then as I get into training, I start becoming a neurosurgeon. I realize that I'm looking every year or two, we get new technologies that allow us to look deeper into the nervous system. And what I realized to my surprise is you can't get to the bottom of it. Like every time we every time we learn something new or get a new microscope or some electron microscope that allows us to see inside a cell or something, we find more organization. We we find more complexity, and there's no no place where you say, "Oh, now I understand how neurons work." I, I completely understand how that could have evolved that way. You, know, you never get there. You just get more and more questions about, "Holy cow! This this protein system that builds this synapse that allows these muscles and nerves to fire together. That protein system is highly organized, and and the parts fit together perfectly. And there's just no way that could have just blown up out of the ocean like that, right? So so for me, it, it it's like every time I learn something new about the nervous system, I get more aware that I don't know everything and more in awe of the fact that we are made in a designed and carefully constructed way. And it is not random and it is not accidental. And it's not a series of random mutations that occur because every time when you actually do science and look at what happens when mutations occur, they are almost never helpful. So when when organisms mutate, they usually get cancer or they die or they don't they're unable to reproduce or something like that. So when you start talking about mutations being beneficial and all of a sudden the lizard can walk and walk out of the ocean, you know we don't see that in nature. We don't see helpful, beneficial mutations occurring. So I, I was like, I think I started with a pretty good place, and I ended up <laughs> learning more about it as I and feeling more secure about it as I've gone along. Boy, well said. You know, I, it's interesting to me that you're, everyone's living by faith. Why so many people want to choose the faith that brings them kind of meaninglessness and no hope and afterlife and all the things that go with that? Why would you choose that over a life of hope and and I guess maybe maybe it comes down to not wanting to have to submit to anything or anyone. You have any thought yeah. about that? 
I do. Um, I, I, I believe that's part of it. I mean, in fact, if you, if you actually research the, the field of naturalism and what that is, so of course Darwin was the most famous naturalist. Um, but naturalists decided there were a group of scientists and, you know, botanists and people like that who, who said, Hey, we are going to agree that there is no God. We're going to agree. We all know that we're smart enough to know that God's not real and it's all, you know, evolution and all that. They, they agreed that they had to be able to explain every finding that they discovered without invoking the supernatural and only using the natural. That's where the term naturalism came from is to say, okay, we all agree there's no spiritual, there's nothing to all that. We have to be able to explain everything in natural terms. And so it started, that branch of science started in the least scientific way possible, in which you said, we know this, we don't need to bother testing it or trying to prove it, we just know it. So let's let's prove everything after that based on that one assumption. Wow. But my question is, why? Why do they want so badly to for there to not be a God? Well, because then you don't have any guardrails, right? Then you can just be happy and do whatever you want. Yeah. Boy, that could be a whole whole podcast there, but very, very <laughs> well said, you know. Uh, um, let me just let me just self promote for a second. Um, there's an episode that I did um, with Dr. Michael Gillen, who was ABC's science reporter for a long time. He's a he's a PhD um, quantum physicist and astrophysicist, dual degree, obviously pretty smart guy from Cornell, trained with Carl Sagan. And his book, um, Seeing Is Believing, um, is really all about this topic, but written from the perspective of a of a big time legitimate scientist he's not they those people look down at doctors like they don't oh, you're not a scientist. <laughs> you know they're not scientists so but but basically michael got to this place where he said wait a minute if we're honest if, if we're honest with what we're seeing quantum physics is pointing us to god quantum physics is answering questions and making us look more deeply at spiritual matters because math can explain everything that we're seeing. And so I would, I would tell people to go back and listen. I'll put the link in the show notes. Go back and listen to that one. Yeah. Well, and I think we both agree it to us, it takes more faith to not believe. So I'm trying. Um, here's a, <laughs> I don't know how you can explain this, but it's so interesting to me that you have this brain, which this is this physical muscle, I guess. Mm-hmm. And you can hold it in your hand and it's just completely physical. Yet within this brain is consciousness and faith and spirituality and emotions. And how, where, how, how do you even describe that? Where the, the physical and the, the soul and this consciousness and all that divides and works and, and anything to say about that? Yeah, this is a really superficial interview. And I- <laughs> it's you know it, this is really the sum this this question that you just asked really is the is the um apex of the debate between science and faith i think because the pure scientist is going to say that we evolved some set of electrical um neurons and synapses and electrical impulses and neurotransmitters that somehow arose uh, a, a de- allowed us to develop consciousness and that consciousness um, is purely the effect of chemical signals within our brain. And we're just big bags of bones and electrical impulses. Right. Um, I, I think the Christian believes, and I believe that everybody deep down believes there's more to it than that, because I think what gives us selective attention, for example, the ability that humans have that Harvey and Lewis, my sleeping dogs, don't have is I can change my mind. I can say, wait, that feeling isn't really true, and I need to think differently about that, and I need to change my mind and change my behavior about that. I think that is the work of the Holy Spirit. Mm. So I think I think God made us and gave us these electrical impulses and these synapses and, and all these chemical things happening in our brains. And I think he made us aware of ourselves in a way that animals aren't because that's his spirit living inside us. And even the people that haven't called on his name, I think he's given them consciousness in, in, a, in a way in an, for the purpose of drawing them to himself and giving them an opportunity to have a relationship with him. And so I think 
this magical electrical organ is more than just, you know, dopamine and serotonin. And those two things combine and somehow sends a spark that makes you say, wow, my name's Tommy. You know, like I, I think it's I think it's spiritual and I, there's no better explanation of it, in my opinion, in the scientific literature than there is for me to say, I believe God put us together in a way that made us aware because he wants to have a relationship with us. We're not just pets to him. Amen. Amen. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Um so in in all of uh, your procedures you've done and been involved with and do you have a story where you it just really seems that you saw a medical miracle? Oh yeah. Um the one that I think is the probably the most miraculous thing that I ever saw was a patient that I never operated on. Um, There was a woman in the ICU in Alabama that had had a stroke in a very small part of her brainstem called the medulla. It's way down low at the base of the brain. And the medulla contains uh, the neurons that generate um, what we call automatic breathing, which is um, how you, when you go to sleep, will continue to breathe even though you're not thinking about breathing. So you don't have to be awake in order to continue to breathe. That's automated. And the reason it's automated is because of a small cluster of cells in your medulla oblongata that create that automatic rhythm that's triggered by CO2 levels in your bloodstream and all that. So you breathe when you need to breathe, even if you're not awake to think about it. And there's a disease called Ondine's curse that happens when a stroke knocks out that automated breathing center. And those people, if they fall asleep, they stop breathing and they die. And so they require permanent mechanical ventilation in order to live because they can't breathe without being ventilated if they're not awake. And so there's an old Greek myth about a, a guy named Ondine who fell in love with a water nymph and then he cheated on her and she cursed him. He he had promised her that he would think he would love her with every breath he took for the rest of his life. And then he cheated on her and she cursed him with having to think about every breath that he would ever take. And, and that story of Ondine's curse uh, is what we call this disease now. So because they have to think about every breath that they're going to take. So I saw this woman who had that problem and she was on a ventilator. And after what some people might not know is after seven or eight days with a breathing tube down your throat, you start to get ulcers in your trachea and you can't live that way for very long. You'll get infections and bad things happen. So after seven or eight days, if you still need the ventilator, we perform a procedure called a tracheostomy where we make a cut and put a tube in down there and we can get the breathing tube out of your mouth. And that'll allow people to eat and do things like that again. And it was six or seven days, and we were coming to the place where this woman was going to require a tracheostomy and a feeding tube. And I told her husband that one night. I was like, look, you know, tomorrow's the day. Like, we really need to do this tracheostomy or she can be taken off the ventilator and go on comfort measures and she'll die. But she needs it tomorrow. It's time. And he said, nope, doc, I've been praying about it. God told me she's going to be okay. We are not having a tracheostomy. She's going to be healed. And I was like, well, I hope so. You know, I've never seen it. I've never seen that happen. I'm praying for her too. But, but, you know, tomorrow we, we're going to have to have this conversation again. You're going to have to make a decision. He said, I'm not going to have to make a decision because she's going to be off the ventilator when you see her tomorrow. And <laughs> so I came in the next day. Tommy, I kid you not, she was sitting up in the chair at the, in the bedside in the ICU, extubated, eating a bagel or something like she was eating breakfast and, off the vent and that stroke is still on her MRI and she can breathe without being ventilated. And, and when I told her, I went out and found her husband. I said, your wife's extubated. And he said, I knew she would be. I mean, he was not even surprised. Like he was like, God said it. I believed it. It's going to happen. And none of us could explain that. Like I still can't explain it. The, the only explanation is not that we had the wrong diagnosis or not that she just, you know, healed somehow. It was that he prayed for her and God answered that prayer and she was cured. And that's, I mean, that's a miracle in my eyes that can't be explained through medical science. Wow. Praise the Lord. Awesome. Okay. I'm going to slowly begin to land this plane. (laughs) So how in the world are you a brain surgeon with your own practice, an author, a podcaster, a blogger, a husband, a father, a grandfather, a dog owner, (laughs) and who knows all the other things that I didn't mention. And how, I'm not trying to be funny, be like, 
somehow you do life in such a way, maybe it's because it's so orderly or maybe my, my other question is how many hours do you sleep a night? How do you do so many things and do them so well? I, I'm not trying to get you to brag. I'm trying, some of us would love to know how to, to live a life like that. How do, how do you accomplish so much all the time? <laughs> you left out really, um, moderate guitar player in that list. Oh, sorry. That's right. I forgot to mention at the beginning when I asked that question about about the the musician and the brain surgeon to tell everyone, yes, you are a player as well. That's right. I know like five chords. No. So I um to be honest with you, I I think it all kind of comes out of its uh, I think everything comes out of everything else. And and what I mean by that is if if you if you look at the the steps that I've taken to become and do all the things that I do, right? I was raised in a spiritual family, went to medical school and became a physician who was also in the military. I got a scholarship to go to med school from the Air Force and and that led me to, you know, Iraq and I had a difficult first marriage and ended up going through a divorce and had PTSD and all that stuff. And and so you had this this person who had spiritual upbringing and, and strong Christian faith and challenges in life that I couldn't make everything work. And I had a big, you know, a big problem and went through a hard thing and, and then, and then had a really traumatic experience in the war and all of that stuff. And then found, you know, Lisa and I got together and, and we, and God repaired us and, and we blended two families and did all that stuff. And then we lost our son. And so if you look at that whole journey of this sort of hard thing and, and recovery and hard thing and recovery and hard thing out of the aftermath of my experience in the war and in losing a child is really when I started writing. And, and the purpose of that was initially was to try to unpack and understand some of the things that I was going through and, and to try to, in a way, try to find some words to help our other children and help my parents and Lisa and all that to grapple with these things because I realized um, there's a verse it's Psalm 144 one that says um, bless the Lord who, who trains my hands for war and prepares my fingers for battle. And I, and I realized when I got to Iraq, I had, I had been trained as a neurosurgeon and trained as a trauma surgeon, but I had never been trained to be at war and, and, and what I mean by that is like nobody told us how to operate when we were getting bombed and mortars were going off and the power went off and the lights went off. And nobody told us how to take care of somebody who had a bomb go off and had, you know, batteries and feces and wires and stuff in their brain. And nobody trained us to do that. And nobody trained us to operate under those extreme circumstances. But what happened is when I got there, I I could do it. Like I, I, it worked. I knew how to stay calm in chaos and I, and I knew how to say, well, I don't, I've never seen this injury before, but I saw these, these other three in Pittsburgh and I can kind of combine things I learned from these guys in my training. I can figure out how to save this guy and, and it just worked. And so I, I recognized that that, that Psalm taught me that God prepares you through the course of your life for the things that he's bringing you to. And Christine Kane always says, God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. And so I, I found myself needing to express that stuff to help other people because not everybody is equipped to handle everything they go through. And they need sometimes a, a pastor or a chaplain or a doctor or somebody, somebody to hand them some tools that they can use. Right. So I started writing and that led to podcasting. And what I what I quickly realized is all of it is about being a good doctor to people. All of it's about finding a way to engage our shared human experience and the particular things that I've been through in a way that doctors and helps people get better. And we always say that phrase, you know, f help help people to become healthier, feel better, and be happier. Th those three things that I think happiness not in the in the sense of just being happy but but happiness in the sense that you have a hope that you can hold on to that gives you the juice to get through life even when it's really hard and so i think to, to answer your question in a very long-winded way is i i don't write and release podcasts and books because i'm I want to make more money or I want to have more followers or any of that. I do it because I got questions about my life that I'm trying to work out. And I know that if I can work them out on paper or in audio form, 
they can help other people too. And so I can help, you know, I can do, I probably do 350 surgeries in 2023, but I'll probably be heard by 2 million people. And those people will get something helpful out of that work that I do, just like the patients I can physically put my hands on will. So for me, it's like this, this, this Rubik's cube of how do I work out my life in a way that honors God. And, and I've got a, I got a right to get there and I got to think about a problem to get there and I got to operate on somebody to get there and I got to release this podcast episode. And then when they all turn the right color, I understand it, what it is that I went through that I was trying to put my finger on. And, and so to me, it doesn't feel like I'm doing too much. It feels like I'm just trying to survive this life. And maybe if I can help you get there too, then we all have this big, you know, someday you're going to come here and we're going to worship on the riverbank together. And that's going to be the fruit of me deciding to do a podcast and reach out to this worship leader that I loved and see if he'd be willing to be on my podcast three years ago. You know, that, to me, it's just all this big tapestry that's that's working itself together in a way. And one of these days we're going to click and all those colors are going to match up. And then that's probably when the trumpet's going to blow and he's going to come back. <laughs> that's, a, that's a weird answer, but that's really what it is. And And so for me, it's like if I don't write – in a particular day, then I feel like I, I left something on the field that day that I should have should have accomplished. I mean, you know, there's just so many people that do so little with their life, and they they seem to have uh, no no purpose and no drive. And and I know, I think, I think partly what I'm hearing is there has to be an engine behind getting up, (laughs) which by the way, I always laugh. Good morning, friend. It's three 30 AM. You know, it's like (laughs) you, I'm like, okay, this is not an ordinary person. This is not anyways, there's an engine. And I think it's a, an engine that you want God to use you in this life for as many years as you have that I think, uh, and, and along with it, it's a way of you, um, um, you know, pressing through your own issues, but for the purpose of helping others. But I think ultimately, you correct me, it's ultimately a calling from God to care for people and help people. And so I think, I think um, more people need to find that I want my life to count for eternity engine so they can um, go to bed every night thinking, you know, I have purpose in my life. And I just think purpose brings so much joy and hope and contentment and you're such a amazing example of that so any, anything else you want to add to that i, I think to uh, this is one of those things that sounds really weird to say but but doing an interview and you got to tell the truth like we're under oath and, like when you lose a child tommy like i haven't lost a parent yet but i know that's something you've experienced and when you lose a child there's there's this guilt piece that says how how come i couldn't save my son or what, what could i have done different that would have led something different and you, you just go down this crazy rabbit trails of you know thoughts of like could i have done something different and then and then after that initial kind of grief healing process starts to happen then for me like i just i really want mitch to be proud of me you know like mm-hmm. i want if there's another parent out there that I can help, or if there's somebody that's hurting that lost somebody that doesn't have the background or training or experience to process it in a healthy way. Like, like I think Lisa and I have both talked about that a lot. Like we, we want our lives to, to honor him, but also like there's this great cloud of witnesses idea that's in Hebrews 12, you know, like the, since then we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Let us cast off the sin that so easily entangles and everything that hinders us. And let's fix our eyes on Jesus. That whole thing, like, like that great cloud of witnesses to me, like he's up there, like, going, come on, dad, don't do that. Like, oh no, dad, you know, but that was a good book, dad. Like, you know, I, I, that's part of it, Tommy, like, to be real honest, like I've got this drive to try to, to try to make sure he's known and remembered and, and just that he'd be proud of me. Wow. Wow. Thank you for that vulnerable honesty. I just, it's just, uh, it's just what you, all you do. It's so exceptional. You know, you're so, 
excellent at what you do. And you're, it just feels like God has given you these abilities and you just every ounce of gifting he gave you until the day you die, you're just rinsing it all out of you in, in such a powerful way and inspiring way. You know, And I, I want to do the same. And that's why I'm, that's why really why I, I wanted to interview you. So people um, could be like me and let your life spur me on to be even more and for the, for the glory of God and for the well, helping his people. Well, thank you. I, you know, I, I, I have some of your music on every one of my episodes in the intro and extra outro and all that. And, and I remember my mom and dad came to visit us in Nebraska one time and I was, we were worshiping and watching some YouTube videos and, and uh, one of your, throwback thursday episodes came on and and she said that guy's like your brother like he's just as weird as you are like <laughs> he's really <laughs> talented and and uh and she's he's your brother and i said he is my like we've, we've developed this it's weird to say friendship with somebody you've never met in the world the physical world but i think that's a kingdom thing um and lisa and i talk about all the time like how our lives work because we're equally yoked like we we have she's every bit as driven and passionate and multi-talented and Swiss army knife ish as I am. And, and we recognize that you and Robin must have that same kind of give and take in your marriage. Um, because you can't have a, a real hard burning, super creative person. And then another person who doesn't have much drive or passion or energy that just doesn't, it doesn't work. So I'm super grateful that I have that equally yoked partner. Um, and we feel like y'all are like a similar kind of group and we're looking forward to getting to know you in, in real life someday. Okay. So get, get, just, just completely only practical now a day in the life. Okay. It's three 30. Oh, it must be time to do my podcast. So walk me through, you wake up and then you go to sleep. What happened in a day? Cause we want to know how you, how you practically do it. Well, I don't stay up very late. I, I've never been a night person, even in college. Like I was the kid that I was the weird kid in the dorm that was in bed at 10 o'clock and I'd get up at two and study when it was quiet. You know, I just, I remember I retain information better and I, I, I think more clearly and I just, I do better in the morning than I do in the evening. So, so I was never a night person. Um, I, I just never enjoyed being up late or, you know, I, I probably can count on one hand the number of new years that I've seen at midnight, you know, <laughs> and, and even when I was in college, you know, and all that, that just never had an appeal for me. So that said, I don't, I don't stay up late and therefore I can get up early without really hurting myself. So I get up pretty early and that's because it's quiet and I spend some time with the Lord. And so my, my day looks like, um, I get up at, 3.30 or so, if I'm not writing a book, if I'm writing, I usually get up at three because I need a couple hours to, to write. Um, but when I'm not writing, I'll get up at 3.30, 3.45. Tata's an early riser too, so he gets up about, about four o'clock every day. So we sit in here in this office and um, just across from the computer, there's two recliners over there and then there's windows and we can see the river that's in the backyard. And so Tata will sit right there and he does his morning thing and I do mine. And um and it's really silence. I, I put these headphones on and I turn on usually a Tommy Walker song or two, um, mix in a little Paul Balash and Matt Redman and some other guys. And I listen to worship music while I'm reading my Bible first thing in the morning. And that's where I get the juice to do everything that I do um, because I feel like it it centers and grounds me. But it also always arms me. The word never goes out empty, it says, um, and it, it always equips me for something that I'm getting ready to engage in, whether it's a podcast episode or writing or replying to emails or whatever. And I have to apologize to you because I realized something like I friend, I'm going to step behind the the fourth wall here real quick and talk to our listener. I, I frequently get excited about something that I'm reading or watching on YouTube and I will text Tommy and say, Hey, you got to watch this. And then I'll realize it's three 30 in the morning. Tommy lives on the West coast. Like I just sent you a text at one o'clock in the morning. I am so sorry. Like I, I will <laughs> diligently try to remember the time zone difference. 
in the future. But, and Tommy's uh, not a morning person. <laughs> so Lisa said that the other day. I said, hey, I sent Tommy this. He's going to love this. And she said, you sent that to him at 1.30 in the morning. His <laughs> time, I quit that. So I'm just apologizing for my lack of awareness of our geographical realities and the fact that you may not get up at 3.30 in the morning like I do. So I'll be more careful about that. But nevertheless, I, I read something, I listen to something, I try to get a few minutes in the Word, and then I do a thing every day since, well, almost every day since we got married, but specifically every day since 2018, I send Lisa an email called Lee Mail every morning. She's the first email that I send every day. I want to, I want to acknowledge that I'm communicating to her my first thoughts of the day, that, that I want her to know that beyond my time in the Word and my time with the Lord, that that the first human thought that I have, I want to make myself send something to her. So it's just short, some sometimes silly, sometimes some verse that I read or something profound, but it's always just a, a way for her. I want her to see in her inbox in the morning that her husband was thinking of her in the morning. So so that's the thing that I do that just, it, it does a number of things for me in that I'm getting ready to go to a busy day in the office or a busy day in the operating room. And I, and I start my day by thinking, the most important human relationship that I have is with Lisa Warren, and I want her to know that, and I want me to know that. And so that that's something I do, Lee Mel, but only Lisa gets. And then um, I do whatever writing or recording or whatever I need to do. And on Mondays and Wednesdays, I'm in the office, so I have to be at the hospital by about 8 o'clock um, Central so Time. You've done your podcast, it's all that, and you still haven't had breakfast? I don't usually eat breakfast. Um not a big breakfast person, but when I do, Lisa will make me something I uh, eat on the way to the hospital usually. Um, so I drink coffee in the morning and I don't usually eat until I'm on my way to work. So uh, record. Um, then when it's time to go to work, I try to work out um, in, in the mornings if I can. Um, I'm going to be – that's an, another focus in 2023. I'm going to try to get my body back in the shape that I want it to be in. Um, at 2021, I wrote – um, hope is the first dose, which you've read. Um, none of our listeners have read yet. Um, and when I'm writing a book, I just, I don't have time. Like I don't have the same amount of time that I do, um, when I'm not writing a book. So I've got to take advantage of getting myself in shape and all that. But, um, then I'll go to the office on Mondays and Wednesdays. I might see 30 people in the office. Um, Tuesdays and Thursdays, I'm in the operating room. Wait, 30 people in one day? Yeah, I see about 30 people on average, 27 to 33 or so people. So that's a non-surgery day. No, those are in the clinic. You just, you come in and tell me that your back hurts and I do an MRI and we talk about your problem and I tell you if I think surgery will be necessary or not. And, you know, we have a conversation and and if you need physical therapy or a shot or something, I send you for that. If you need surgery, we talk about the ins and outs of that and get it scheduled and all of that stuff. And then, you know, responding to physician correspondence and paperwork and all that stuff. And then Tuesdays and Thursdays are surgery days um, for me. So I'll do yesterday. I did four surgeries. So I finished about 5 PM, start at seven and finish at five. And then to this morning, I had an unplanned emergency brain surgery that I did at eight 30. So I, I went and made rounds, did surgery at eight 30, got home at 11. Um, and had another podcast interview before yours at one and this one at two. So that's, that's kind of a week in a nutshell for me. Oh man. Okay. That's kind of what I thought. <laughs> wow. Well, that's inspiring. You know, there are just so many people on this earth, <laughs> even, even just from, <laughs> even if you just wanted to say from a secular point of view that just make the world worse, <laughs> there's people that make it better. And, <laughs> Wow, you make it a lot better. That's really as do you, my brother. Really inspiring. Well, I just um I admire you. You inspire me. You make me want to, especially going into the new year. I don't I don't maybe that's not when this is posting. Maybe I should say this, but well, it's early in the year, anyways. Just That'd be the to, first Friday of next year. This one will come out next Friday. So yeah. So it being early in the year, yeah, you, you your life, who you are, greatly inspires me to to continue to step up <laughs> to another level so that I can um, live out what God has put me on this planet to do. Because I don't I don't want to not do that. And so thank you. You are a huge inspiration. 
for me in that way. So, well, thank yes. you. I'm, I, I find it fascinating still that I have a relationship with you. Like I, I, I made no secret about the fact that you had such an impact in my spiritual journey. And, um, I just can't wait to get to meet you in real life and, um, can't wait for the, um, upcoming Tommy Walker bluegrass solo flat picking guitar <laughs> album. <laughs> I've I thrown s- Tommy a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> I saw the, that video you sent me, the Billy the strings. Yeah. Oh, it's flat pickers. Something. <laughs> it was, uh, flat pickers. I can't remember the name of the channel, but it seemed to be all that kind of, yeah, that guy does all bluegrass, like education and stuff. It's great. So, well, Tommy, any further questions? This is your interview, man. You get to call it to a close when you're ready. All right. I'll just close out with this. What's it like always knowing you're the smartest guy in the room? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that. Actually, Lisa and I had a great experience. We worked at Auburn University for 12 years, and and our office uh, was in the third floor of the MRI research building. It was a, a, a facility that was built around this research MRI scanner that was multiple generations ahead of the ones that you're even using now. So if you hurt your knee and go get an MRI, um, it's something called a 1.5 or 3 Tesla MRI scan, which means that those numbers mean how strong the magnet is. Basically, Tesla is a unit of measure of magnetic field strength. And way back in 2008 and nine, they had a seven Tesla MRI scanner in Auburn, which at the time was like, you know, a hundred times more powerful. They could, they could image a rabbit and the magnetic field would elevate, levitate the animal off the table. It was so strong. So, and you could do things like beating heart MRIs and all this. And so Siemens Corporation and Auburn University had this partnership and we were doing some research with them. So we would have these meetings and you would have, you know, you would have a, a, a nuclear physicist from Germany and electrical engineers and, and mechanical engineers and, and, all these crazy triple PhD people from all over the world. And then you'd have me, a neurosurgeon, and Lisa, who's a professional interior designer. And we were the dumb people in the room. Like we were, we were, we were like, these people are talking about stuff that we don't understand. Like it was crazy. So I've always had that sort of, that sort of humbling, you know, leveling kind of thing. Like I know there's a lot of people out there smarter than I am. Like, well, welcome to my world. That's how I live. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah. Anyways, that's uh, uh, I, yeah. I think that'll do it, Doctor Lee. <laughs> I, I have, I, it made me feel really smart that I could even ask you questions. So thank you. <laughs> oh, this was a great talk. I think it'll really uh, be interesting to people to hear the other side of the mic. So thank you, Tommy, for wanting to do this. First of all, it's a great honor to to be interviewed on your podcast on episode one of the Tommy Walker podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> I do have an idea. I think it'd be a cool podcast, but uh, I just don't, I, I'm just, I don't know how to fit it into my life, but it would be, be called worship stories. So it'd be like experiences I've had around the world and where God really moved or something crazy, funny or profound happened. And then it could also be stories from history, maybe some him stories some revivalist stories whatever i just think that would be a great one but i don't have the time to research it but anyways maybe well if, if that idea is from the lord then what will happen is it'll become unbearably unavoidable to you and you've got this tech team around you who can make all that stuff happen like you won't have to do what i'm doing which is all the mixing and all that stuff you've got people who can do that for you so we'll just be praying that god gives you clarity about that and as a small segue to promote something for you, um, friend, I just heard about um, Tommy and his lovely wife, Robin, have written a Bible study for YouVersion, uh, which is the Bible app that you can download for free. Um, tell us about your Bible study, Tommy. Yeah, well, early early this year, we actually released an album, it seems like years ago now, <laughs> called Generation Hymns. It's actually Generation Hymns 3. Just uh you know the hymns were the beginning of my faith as a child and we call them the great uh generational worship connectors hymns have been through the years so that's the idea of the albums is to is to bring the generations together instead of divided and worship yeah. the lord with them so that's the album and so we've written a reading plan that 
goes with it, really. The reading plan doesn't have to be connected to the album, but most of you know you version. They have like half a billion, I think, like users around the world where the, all these translations of the Bible are completely free to you. And they have many hundreds, maybe a thousand uh, different Bible reading plans. Some of them are seven days, some uh, long, some of them are a year long. And yeah. this one is just a seven day. It tells stories about how the, some of these different hymns were written. I give some little commentary on it. And then Robin found several wonderful scriptures to go with it, to meditate on throughout the day. So it's called Generation Hymn Stories. And it's I'm I'm going to start it and invite all my version friends to start it on January 3rd for my first uh, reading plan of the year. Wow. We'll put links in the show notes and um, let's all do it as a community, um, folks. You won't hear this before January 3rd, but I'll give you a start date uh, and we can all do the Tommy and Robin study together. And it'll be a great little seven day walk through some of those great hymns. Tommy, it's always a pleasure to talk to you, my friend. Thank you for doing this today. Yeah. Thank you so much. An honor to be had and to uh, interview you. Thank you. Love you, man. Thank you. Hey, thanks for listening. Please subscribe to the show so you automatically get every episode. And if you like the show, you'll love my weekly letter. Check out my writing at drleewarren.substack.com, drleewarren.substack.com. Get the free newsletter every week for my best prescriptions for becoming healthier, feeling better, and being happier through the power of faith and neuroscience smashing together via self-brain surgery, drleewarren.substack.com. And if you need prayer, go to the prayer wall at wleewarrenmd.com slash prayer. The theme music for the show is Make Us One by Tommy Walker, graciously provided for free by the great folks over at tommywalkerministries.org. Check it out and consider supporting them, tommywalkerministries.org. Remember, you can't change your life until you change your mind. And the good news is you can start today. I'm Dr. Lee Warren. I'll talk to you soon. God bless you, friend. Have a great day.